so that we can evaluate the program. So here's what we came up with. We're very proud of our objectives. So we want students to experience science as a dynamic process. All too often, kids get into a classroom, they have a textbook that's this thick, they're memorizing facts, they're regurgitating them, and they're not excited about science. And so this is a way for students to get hands-on in a world that doesn't require a lot of wet lab experience or time commitment from our mentors in that regard. So this is an opportunity to see that science is happening in labs. They're asking questions, answering them, finding out new data, exploring new ways to um, find out these new facts. So it's a very dynamic field, and we want students to see that. Students also get a chance to engage in modeling practices. So we develop physical models on a three-dimensional printer. But beyond that, modeling can also be a pathway that's drawn out, or a vision of how you think something's going to happen, or a model of some sort that really represents what's happening within um, a cell. You'll see a lot of the students modeling out some of the pathways or some of the reactions that might be happening. So this is a way to engage them in that modeling practice that we see in research labs. The students also get a chance to learn technology. They're learning how to design molecules with um, JML computer software program. We print on a three-dimensional printer, which is a new technology. They also get a chance to explore a specific research topic. So whatever their mentor is working on, this is an opportunity for the students to see some cutting-edge research. At our poster session last Friday, we had posters that had data on it that had not yet been published anywhere first on that smart team poster. So it's an opportunity for them to see that cutting edge research happening right here, right now. They get a chance to develop communication skills. So regardless of what career path our students pursue, more than likely they're gonna to have to communicate in some way or another. My husband, who's an IT programmer, total introvert, had nothing, to, wanted nothing to do with speaking in front of people. He has to do presentations now on a weekly, if not monthly basis, and it just is something that he's had to learn as well. So communication transcends beyond the science careers. And it also gives students a chance to practice teamwork. So I know if you're involved in athletics, you have that teamwork opportunity as well. But in the world of careers and science and other um, pathways, you're going to have to work in groups. Inevitably, at some point in your life, you're going to have to do that. And as you add people to a group, it can become more and more problematic. So this is an opportunity to resolve those issues and learn those teamwork skills now at a younger age that can then be applied to the college setting and then even further beyond into the career setting. The Smart Team program itself consists of three different phases. There's the qualification phase, the research and design phase, and the presentation phase. During the qualification phase, which starts back in September, students come out to MSOE or here at the Medical College, oops, and they start to learn some basics. So at the beginning, we talk about protein biochemistry, how water influences the way a protein folds, how do proteins come together from their basic building blocks and amino acids. We do this all very early, on Saturday mornings in the fall, so the fact that I actually get them out there speaks volumes as well. So the reason why we can get them there on early on a Saturday morning is because we have all these toys for the students to play with. So as you can see, the picture is kind of cycling through here. We get them engaged in understanding the basic concepts of protein biochemistry by handing them models to represent water, to represent amino acids, and proteins as they fold up to their final form. And this gives the students a chance to really grasp what protein biochemistry is and what impact it has on the structure and function of that particular protein. As you can see by Andrew and Zach's face over here, they're very smiley, so we have a lot of fun on Saturday mornings, even though it is early Saturday morning. The second time we get together, we actually are here at the medical college, and we go upstairs to the computer lab where we have 100 different machines, and the students can sit down and learn about JMOL and how to design a particular protein. So walk through a number of exercises, learning how to just use the program. At that point, I give them their part one of their qualification challenge, which is to research and design a particular protein to show me, before I match them with their researchers, that they know what they're doing with respect to designing models and writing abstracts. This year, the students modeled the PLA protein, which is found on the bacterium Yersinia pestis, which is the causative agent for bubonic plague or the Black Death. So we had a great time exploring death within the world of bacterial diseases. The third meeting we have is where they have their qualification challenge. So the first part was designing the model and writing an abstract. The second one is they come in another Saturday morning. I ask them a ton of questions with respect to protein biochemistry, how water influences um, protein folding, what the PLAW protein does relevant to the bubonic plague. They receive water molecules for all of their correct answers, which they hang above their heads. And then you can see, again, more hands raising, lots of questions. This year we also incorporated an activity where I gave out these clues to a mythical creature 
that Hagrid out at Hogwarts had found, and they had to model what they thought this creature looked like based on these clues that we had given them out week by week. And so this was a chance for them to have some fun modeling and exploring. So in addition to the questions I ask about proteins and biochemistry, I also ask questions something to do with like the Packer game or something like this. The answer? Hunger Games next Friday. <laughs> so then our kickoff into the research and design phase is the mentor match. And this is where we bring all the mentors in. We have our students sitting around tables with our teams. And we have the mentors go through kind of a speed dating activity where they sit and talk with all the uh, students, about four minutes, get to know them, ask them questions, rotate around. And at the end of it, we have a little competition to see who learned more about the, the teachers, or I'm sorry, the teams about the mentors and the mentors about the teams. After that, we match up the mentors with the teams and they start talking about their specific projects. And what's happening? What's the particular protein that we're going to be investigating? What's the story that we can tell? From here, the students get a chance to also tour the labs of our researchers to see what a research lab looks like and to start developing their models and writing abstracts relevant to their molecular story. During the next phase, which is the presentation phase, the students receive their models that they've been working on during the research and design phase. And then they start working with their mentor on how to tell that story. So we kick off the presentation phase talking about how to make a poster, how to do an oral presentation, and so during January and February, the students are working closely with me and their mentors to develop their posters and to develop their oral presentations. And it's fun here because this, some of our mentors are new to the program and this is the first time they've gotten a model. And the fascination that the mentors have with their models, you see he's not looking at anybody, he's just looking at the model. We see that all too often where the mentor holds that model and suddenly you've lost eye contact. It's like, oh, we're going to talk about this and this and this. So it's really fun to see the mentors get excited about something that the students have developed. So last Friday, we had our poster session, which is one of the final presentations that the students work on, out here in the cafeteria of the medical college. And this was a chance for the students to tell their molecular stories to a scientific audience. We hold the poster session out here, which is kind of in the main thoroughfare from the basic science building out to the parking lot. So I kind of track people as they walk through here. Um, it's kind of nice because our researchers literally cannot walk past posters without stopping because they get excited about it. And then to find out that they're high school students or middle school students working on a project and, ooh, you have a fun toy to do. It was a great session. I think um, we had a wonderful time last Friday and it was really exciting to see those. So I'm going to stop for just a second and I'm going to actually turn it over to Nick Goldner who is a former Smart Team student at Nathan Hill High School and he's going to share with us his experience post Smart Team land. Can everyone hear me all right? Um, my name is Nick Goldner. Uh, I'm I, uh, a smart team alumni uh, at Nathan Hill High School. Uh, currently, I'm a sophomore at Wisconsin Lutheran College right across the street from here. Um, so when I started Smart Team, um, the, the, the major reason, and to me at the time, the most important reason to join Smart Team was because there was a really, really, really cute girl on the Smart Team. Um, and less importantly was, uh, I, I like science, and I had taken a lot of science classes, but I wasn't sure if I actually wanted to do science uh, for the rest of my life. And so, through the SMART team, uh, I was able to get some research experience and, and really fall in love with science. There were, there were two things that, that happened um, from the SMART team. The first was that um, I fell in love with it. It's something that I wanted to do. And uh, second was, I, I found that research, and everything that goes along with research, is really quite beautiful. And, and I, say, I say this because um, one night, uh, it was December 31st, it was a Friday, I believe, at 11.59 um, in 2010, so New, uh, New Year's Eve, uh, I was sitting in the lab and I was uh, taking pictures of these heart cells. And as I was taking pictures of these heart cells, I looked up at the clock, uh, and I realized that it was a minute before New Year's Eve. And two things went through my mind. Um, wow, I can't believe I missed the party. And the second one, <laughs> The second one was, I don't think I really care that much. Um, and the reason why I didn't care is because I had found something that was absolutely stunning. It, it was the most gorgeous thing that I'd ever seen. What I had done is I had taken these heart cells that I, that I had gotten from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, and I had um, pushed them down the, uh, the line of, down to the, the heart cell line. And I, I labeled them with these uh, fluorescent labels so that the actin was red so I could so I can visualize the, the morphology and the cytoskeleton of the, 
of the cell. And what was amazing was that no one else in the world had ever seen those particular heart cells. Yes, you know, people have, have done this, and yes, this wasn't a novel thing, but they never saw my heart cells. I was the first person to ever see this. And to me, that was, that was astounding, that was beautiful. I mean, how often can you say, wow, I'm the only one to ever see this? Not very often. And so because of that, I realized that this is something that I could easily spend you know, the next seven to 10 years in school doing, and then the rest of my life working on. And so, you as students and, and as, as researchers and as parents, you have the opportunity with Smart Team to really get to understand the beauty of science, to, to, to be exposed to these, these new and cutting edge uh, techniques, these new, these new, this new data, this new research, and you have the opportunity to share this with other people, your grandma, your, your teachers, your friends. I mean, you're, you're the front line right here. You're, you're the people that get to, to, to explore and to understand what's going on and then share that with other people. And that, I think, is also beautiful. We've been talking about communication as being one of the biggest things, and it, it really is. Congratulations, you found a, a new cell that no one else has discovered. Now you have to share that with everyone else. You have to, you have to uh, disseminate the, the, the information. And to me, I think that whole collaboration, that whole process, is one of the most beautiful things that we, as scientists and as students and as, and as academics, um, uh, have. So. Well, uh, enjoy your presentations. I hope, uh, I hope everything goes well. I heard some music um, playing before, so it should be interesting. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And now I'd like to bring down the Kettle Moraine Smart Team. We are the Kettle Moraine Smart Team, and this year we researched GRB2, which, an which is an essential protein in cell signaling, angiogenesis, and most importantly, cell division, or mitosis. However, despite its importance in the normal functioning of a cell, GRB2 can also be quite harmful. Similar to the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, GRB2 can be both the hero and the villain. So first off, we have the Dr. Jekyll side of GRB2. In a healthy cell, GRB2 interacts with various growth factors, stimulating the RAS signal transduction pathway which facilitates cell growth and, and division, or mitosis. And this is mitosis. Uh, this cell mitosis is also essential in regulating embryonic growth and development. So Harrison is an egg. But thanks to GRB2 and mitosis, his cells can divide, he can grow, and he can come out of his egg. Um, mitosis is also critical for epithelial morphogenesis, which includes tissue maintenance and wound healing. As an example, the kidney is in constant need of repair, and therefore there is constant tissue reconstruction and mitosis occurring. So Sean is a tired kidney, but thanks to the help of GRB2 and mitosis, the kidney can be rejuvenated and can function healthily again. <laughs> In wound healing, GRB2 works together with the platelet-derived growth factor, or PDGF, in causing angiogenesis, or the growth of new blood vessels. This process is essential in healing damaged tissues. So Bailey has just gotten a paper cut from a newspaper, but with the magic of GRB2, the wound heals itself and stops bleeding. So as a review, mitosis is the division of cells. GRB2 is involved in this process through the RAS signaling pathway. When activated, this pathway spurs cell division. However, if GRB2 becomes hyperactive, mitosis can go unregulated, causing erratic cell division. This cell division is what causes the buildup of cells and leads to tumors. Now, this is our protein GRB2, and when it is overactive, like it is in cancers, it becomes acetylated and phosphorylated. Uh, in this model, the lysines, which are shown in light green, are acetylated. The tyrosines, shown in yellow, are phosphorylated. And the threonine, shown in red, is also phosphorylated. 
the hydrogen bonds are shown in light blue and the struts are white. And the glioblastoma multiform is the most common and aggressive grade of brain cancer and the pathway which causes this cancer is regulated by GRV2. It is generally diagnosed in older patients and the average survival time is less than a year. Uh, it is the most invasive type of cancer and grows very rapidly, mainly through angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the growth of new capillaries, which provide blood to new tissues. It is an essential process in maintaining the body. If you're a developing fetus, this means that you can develop and grow. For an athlete, this means that you can grow new muscle tissues. However, angiogenesis and GRV2 can be involved in development of cancers, thus leading us to the Mr. Hyde side of GRV2. Harrison is an evil GRV2. He throws green beach of cards all over, leading to angiogenesis. The streamers represent the new capillaries growing from angiogenesis, and this angiogenesis leads to cancer cell growth, which are the black balloons. A hyperactive GRV protein also leads to cells releasing excessive amounts of VGIF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. This large amount of VGIF attaches to receptors on nearby capillaries, causing angiogenesis to the tumor and allowing it to thrive. Uh, angiogenesis, in this way, is one of the most important processes which allow tumors to grow. Uh, the new blood vessels to the tumor provide nutrients for its growth, as well as a pathway into the vascular system. By allowing the tumor access to the bloodstream, tumor cells can travel through the circulatory system and root themselves anywhere else in the body. In this way, GRB2 poses a double threat. By becoming hyperactive, it causes both erratic cell division, leading to an increase in tumor size, and also provides a mechanism to both feed the tumor as well as allow it to spread.